Um, I'm Eric Hansen. I'm the president of the Honors Program Student Advisory Board. Um, I'm also one of your speakers this evening, um, but I will go last, I promise. Um, we uh, are lucky to be joined by five eminent scholars tonight to talk about uh, responses to global crises. Uh, we have Father Brock O'Connor, uh, Dr. Zara Rizzoli, uh, Mr. Tim Nendick, and Mr. Chris Vyatska. So we'll just jump right into things and start with Father Connor. What guidelines do we as a society utilize in making our judgments about global crises? Number one, self-interest. Number two, unenlightened self-protection. Number three, maximum denial about the suffering of others. Number four, guarding the financial bottom line. Uh, number five, xenophobia or fear of the other. And in fearful times, fear conquers idealism, religious values, the commitment to the common good, and the audacity to be for the other. So there are lots of different things his father just told us that keep us from responding to disasters, that hold us back. And for me, it really did come down to fear, and in particular, fear of the unknown, because when I was asked to respond to the Haiti earthquake in 2010, I didn't know if there would be clean water, electricity, a safe place to sleep, and so all these things were terrible. I didn't even know why I would be coming home. I couldn't tell my family, I'll be back in two weeks, I'll be back in a month. And so that was terrifying. But what I realized was that <laughs> all of these obligations, all of these different fears weren't going to go away. There was always going to be family to worry about, a job to worry about, students to think of, class to respond to. And so for me, what really got me over that hurdle, over those fears, were realizing that it's never going to get easier. Right? Those things are always going to be there. And so when you hear that call, when you respond to that call, put it in perspective. It's never going to get easier to say yes. So uh, in philosophy, we love to make distinctions and ask questions. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make some distinctions and ask some questions. I'm not going to answer them. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so let's start with the distinction. We can distinguish between descriptive questions, how we in fact respond to global crises and normative questions about how we should respond to global crises. Let's focus on the normative question. What obligations, if any, do we have to respond to these crises? And how should we think about them? In particular, should we be strictly impartial in who we help? In other words, do we have an obligation to help everyone we can? Here's an example. Uh, in the 80s, uh, Ethiopia was struck with a severe famine. Several hundred thousand uh, <laughs> starving Ethiopians sought refuge in overcrowded refugee camps in the Sudan. It, uh, the Israeli government instituted an airlift in order to rescue specifically Ethiopian Jews. They managed to rescue some, some 7,000 uh, Ethiopian Jews. In 91, famine struck again in the midst of a civil war, and they instituted another uh, airlift, this time much larger, and they saved 14,000 okay, 14, Jews. <laughs> On the one hand, suppose you think that we should be impartial. You'll think of the Israelis who were playing favorites. And if they were playing favorites, what, uh, what they did was grossly unfair. After all, the non-Jewish Ethiopians were just as much in need of help as their Jewish compatriots. Did the Israelis, insofar as they had obligations to help, have an equal obligation to help the other Ethiopians? If they did, what they did was wrong. On the other hand, suppose you think the Israeli has had special obligations to the Ethiopian Jews that they didn't have to others. Then they would have done something wrong. They would have violated their obligations if they were impartial and helped all the Ethiopians. So my question is, do we have an obligation to help or intervene wherever we can, or do we have special obligations to certain groups that we don't have to other groups? <laughs> <laughs> so the problem is this. How do we respond to crises? And my answer is what they love, which is compassionate and agape. Now, to us, 17, 18, 19 year olds, that's really idealistic and abstract. And that's really good, because it is. We can begin to learn what this means by building up what an author, Chris Hewitt, says is a muscle memory. We can begin to learn what this means by serving and building relationships in the here and now with the people we see in the day to day. And when we do that, we discover in their suffering and in ourselves this common thread of hope and life. And that's the human experience. And that impels us to act when we see suffering on really big scales. But we're driven to use that whole human potential, which is ourself. And that's what makes hope. That's what makes change. Ignacio A. Korea, a Jesuit, says love produces hope. And that's our response, to give our whole self, when we're ready to, to build hope up in the future. 
When crises occur, they can reveal underlying, festering social problems in the affected society. The greatest modern example of this phenomenon, I believe, is found in post-Katrina New Orleans. Hurricane Katrina killed nearly 2,000 Americans, displaced hundreds of thousands of people, and caused more than $80 billion in damage. About four years after Katrina, there were still 71,000 abandoned buildings in the city, and more than a quarter of the city's population had not returned. The social problem revealed in the wake of the storm was racial tension. Katrina destroyed what had at best been tenuous relations between whites and blacks in New Orleans before the storm. At the tables, I will talk about the impact of race during and after Katrina, specifically discussing looting, mortality rates, and most importantly, flood plans. Thank you. <laughs>